Unit 4, Ethical and Legal Issues Affecting the Nursing Assistant. So ethical standards are really guides to moral behavior. So people who provide health care voluntarily agree to live up to these standards. So when you become a certified nurse aide, you're agreeing to uphold these standards. When rules are not followed, the nurse aide fails to live up to the promise to give safe, correct care and to do no harm. And this is sort of the basic underlying ethical principle for every health care provider is to do no harm. So legal standards, so guides to lawful behavior. So when laws are not obeyed, the nurse aide may be prosecuted and found liable for injury or damage. So this is taking those ethical standards a step further and there's actual um, laws that are protecting our patients from um, undue harm. So legal guilt can, be result, can result in the payment of fines or imprisonment and obviously loss of certification as well. So ethical questions. So questions of medical ethics are under more scrutiny than any other time in history. So the issue here is really scarcity of resources. So, you know, people are living longer. We have more advanced technology. So there's just not enough healthcare resources to go around for every single person. So ethical issues um, are, you know, are created because of the scarcity of resources. But it's very important. The basic ethical rule is that life is precious. So some basic ethical principles. So respect for autonomy. So we have an obligation to respect the autonomy of other persons, which is to respect the decisions made by other people concerning their own lives. This is very, very important in Western cultures to really have this autonomy. And you know, this is reflected also in our patient-centered care with the patient at the center, and they're really able to, to direct and guide their own care and make the decisions they want to for their health. So beneficence, so is an obligation to bring about good in all of our actions. And then non-maleficence, so an obligation not to harm others. And this is very important in healthcare that we have this obligation not to harm others. And then justice is an obligation to provide others with whatever they are owed or deserved. So these ethical principles are often in conflict with each other. So for example, um, respect for autonomy and non-maleficence. So the issue is when really there's two ethical principles that are in conflict with each other. So a great example would be um, smoking. So the person has this respect for autonomy, so we respect the, their decision to smoke. You know, if they want to smoke, it's concerning their own lives, their own choices, but an obligation not to harm others. So if that person is choosing to smoke in a car with their children in there, it's now impacting, harming the, the children by having secondhand smoke that they're not able to get away from. So then you have these two conflicting ethical principles. Do we respect that autonomy, that person's decision to make choices in their own lives, or do we have this obligation not to harm others? And so there's many, many ethical decisions that are made all the time, and there's ethical committees that go about evaluating these principles. So patient information. So it's really important. This is HIPAA guidelines. So really to discuss only in appropriate places. So, you know, not in the cafeteria, not in the elevator. So really using, you know, care conferences and places to discuss health information where it will be uh, remain confidential. So discuss only with the proper people. So understanding that really someone's um, the need to pass along personal health information is really only on a need to know basis. So the person must need to know that information in order to do their job effectively. So also referring patient requests for information about lab results, their condition, or a course of illness to the nurse or physician. So just referring to the nurse or physician to answer these questions. And then let the nurse or physician relay information about patient's death and then follow ethical code to ensure respect of patient's personal religious beliefs. So you'll come in contact with people who have very different religious beliefs, oftentimes beliefs that are in conflict with your own religious beliefs. It's very, very important as a healthcare provider that you respect that person's beliefs and allow them to believe as they choose. Uh, and then remember HIPAA, so only on a need to know basis. So patient information should only be shared by people who need to know that information to do their job. So this is a little cartoon. So somehow your medical records got faxed to a complete stranger. He has no idea what's wrong with you either. So it's really important that we sort of respect that, you know, we ourselves are consumer healthcare consumers as well, and that we wouldn't want our personal health information being shared inappropriately or not by people who need to know it to do their job.
So avoid breaking laws by being careful to stay within your scope of practice. So this is dictated by the State Board of Nursing, the Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies, and the Board of Nursing, so under the Certified Nurse um, Practice Act. Certified Nurse Aid Practice Act. So stay within your own authority and do only tasks that you're taught, so within your scope of training. So if you if you have not been taught a task, but it is within your scope of practice, you need to make sure that you're trained on how to do that. So a great example is going to be um, a mechanical lift. So making sure we didn't, we didn't teach you that in our course. We don't have mechanical lifts. So when you go out and you're going to be using them in practice, which is within your scope of practice, that you're properly taught on how to use them before you use a, a mechanical lift. And then request guidance from the proper person before taking action in a questionable situation. So again, you know, you're going about using a mechanical lift, you have a question about it, you need to make sure that you, you talk with the appropriate person before you, you go about um, taking action in that situation. You're not sure about how a particular lift is done, you need to make sure prior to using it with a patient that you, you make sure your questions are answered. So negligence. So negligence is the um, is really important. So we'll talk about first malpractice is the improper or negligent conduct that results in harm to the patient. So you've heard malpractice, malpractice lawsuits, and things along that that nature. So you're guilty of negligence if you're injuring a patient by not performing the work as taught. So you did not follow the policies and procedures of the institution. So you used a mechanical lift and you didn't, you know, use the leg straps right, and so you did not perform the work as taught causing um, harm to somebody else. So you didn't carry out the job in a conscientious manner. So making sure, you know, obviously time is an issue for everybody in healthcare, but making sure that you're always carrying out your job in a conscientious manner. So negligence, it could be accidental or deliberate. So, you know, again, time is a big issue, and that's often what's blamed, you know, negligent acts are actually blamed on time. So, you know, you know Mrs. Jones has fragile skin, she's an elderly woman, and you, because of time, you don't get the additional assistance you need to transfer her, you hit her leg against the wheelchair and cause a skin tear. So it may have been accidental, but it was negligent because you didn't follow the policies and procedures and you didn't do what you needed to do to prevent harm. So it also may be a result of action or omission. So you may also be um, negligent by a failure to act. So you have a, a patient with dementia and you forget to take care of them and causes some harm to them. That could be an act of omission and a failure to act. So still causing negligence. So in either situation, um, the patient's not given the expected level of care. So again, we're held to higher standards as healthcare providers and you're not giving them that expected level of care. So a couple of examples of negligence. So the nurse aide gives a patient a bath and doesn't check the water, water temperature first and the patient is burned. So this is, you know, the person doesn't follow the policies and procedures they're supposed to, again, always having you yourself checking the, the water as the certified nurse aide and having the patient check the water so you weren't following, following appropriate policy and so the patient had injury, the patient was burned. So a nurse aide gives the patient a food tray without checking the tray. The tray belonged to another patient. So again, you know, we always, as we're going through our skills, especially with feeding, we make sure that we're identifying our patient and that it is the correct food tray. So the patient who got the tray eats the wrong consistency food and chokes. And this is so, so important that we make sure, particularly if someone's on a special puree diet, that they're not going to aspirate, they're not going to choke um, by eating the wrong consistency food. So false imprisonment, also known as unlawful imprisonment. So restraining the patient's movement or actions without proper authorization. So making sure uh, you are only using restraints um, as under a physician's order and as a last resort. So again, it's very, very important that the physician has ordered the use of restraints and that you've tried every other um, way to keep the patient safe. And so this is really a last resort. You know, and when using restraints, you also need to make sure that you're, you're checking circulation distal to whatever site they're placed on. So, you know, for example, these on the right hand side, these are wrist restraints. So making sure that you're checking the fingers for good circulation, you're checking capillary reflux fell to make sure that there's no um, you know injury there and that you're checking underneath the restraints to make sure that there's no skin breakdown. 
So assault and battery, you've probably heard these terms before, but assault is intentionally attempting to touch a patient's body or even threatening to do so, and then battery, touching a patient without that patient's permission. So you'll often hear these two terms used together, assault and battery. So abuse, this is a very important uh, thing to understand. So abuse is intentionally acting or failing to act in a way that causes or could cause harm or death to a patient. So it, you know you have two things going on here. You have intent, so you're intentionally acting, and then you have harm. So intent and harm are both needed for abuse. And then for verbal abuse, abusing a patient verbally, so you may have physical or verbal abuse, and it may be directed toward a patient or expressed about a patient. So we'll watch a quick video where it talks about nurse aides um, it's saying abuse complaints are ignored. Tuesday evening to you. I'm Chris Ty. Ramona is off. It all started with a phone call to Channel 3 investigator Tom Meyer. Tom, you saw this video of alleged elderly abuse. You just had to step in here. Well, how can you not, Chris? The hidden camera video shows a helpless elderly woman being roughed up by nurses' aides at the Metro Health Skilled Nursing Home. The video shows them throwing her, slapping her, and jabbing her. We have new information after digging into their personnel files and talking with nursing home insiders. Just was handling. This nurse's aide works at the Metro Health Skilled Nursing Home, the same place where we showed you hidden camera video of 78-year-old Esther Pisker being mistreated. The aide, who fears reprisals for speaking out, says the administration has ignored her complaints of unexplained abuse, which is unrelated to Esther's case. I've reported different things to do with way of scratches, bruises, and it's pretty much like you would hear it. It's like you consider a troublemaker. Channel 3 News has learned that the nurse's aide who sprayed Esther in the face with an unknown liquid was recently awarded Nurse's Aide of the Year. The aide told Metro Health and the state it was perfume. We also learned from court records that nurse's aide Jennifer Perkins is a convicted felon, pleading guilty to theft in 2008. The offense was committed after she was hired and underwent a criminal background check. Virgin Caraballo, fired for her handling of Esther, received high marks in her evaluations. Her superior said in February of last year that she maintains a safe environment for her residents, that she is very conscientious with the care she gives. A few months ago, a supervisor said Caraballo is attentive to residents' needs and very thorough. Esther's son, Steve, says hidden camera video tells a different story. There's at least 20 or 30 videos of activity on there that's questionable. This video clearly shows care that we find unacceptable, and we've taken immediate action. Steve says who knows what else hidden cameras would have caught. He says nurses' aides made sure the cameras didn't see everything. The administrator told the aides to keep to cover the cameras. Metro Health provided a doctor to do their talking. My understanding is that they were allowed to cover it during personal care. There's privacy issues. The hidden camera video may have exposed quality of care issues at the nursing home. You got your baby doll? But Rebecca Dugan of Cleveland says she removed her mom from the facility last year on allegations the facility neglected her. There's always like black and blue marks, her stuff being stolen, her not being showered properly. You could tell that my mother wasn't pottied all day long. Well, Metro Health has fired nurses' aides Virgin Caraballo and Giselle Nelson. They suspended a third aide, Jamik Shaw Whitlaw, for five days. Caraballo, the only aide who faces criminal charges, was bailed out of jail. Metro Health issued a written statement. You can see at WKYC.com. Tom, this has to resonate with everybody who has uh, grandparents, parents, and nursing sure. homes. You mentioned that one of the nurses' aides has a felony conviction. Right. How is it she's able to even work with the elderly? Well, uh, according to state law, it appears she can't. A nursing home or any care provider, Chris, for that matter, cannot employ a caregiver who's been convicted of any one of 55 criminal offenses, including theft. 
Metro Health says it's done two background checks on Perkins since 2005 when she was hired. They said if she's been convicted of a crime, then the state should remove her from the registry of licensed, employable nurses aides. We'll try to sort all this out as we go along. Yeah, this is probably not the last we hear of it, Tom. No, Thank all. you very much for that. And this investigation of yours is generating lots and lots of feedback. On our website, WKYC's Facebook page, Bev Breen writes, This is terrible. I hope that aide goes to jail where others can do to her what she did. Okay, so those are just some examples of abuse, and obviously those videos are hard to watch, but, you know, really understanding that there was intent and actual harm, and so that's why the definition of abuse is there. So if you're suspecting a patient in your care is being abused by others, you always want to discuss with the supervisor. So you're always going to report any type of abuse up the chain of command, and as a CNA in a facility, your chain of command above you is going to be the nurse. So you're not responsible for determining whether abuse has actually occurred, so you don't have to decide, okay, what is that bruise there for? Could it have been from this? Could it have been from that? It's just important that you just have to determine, you don't have to determine whether abuse has occurred, you just have to pass along what you've noticed. And then you always report up the chain of command, so to your nurse. So neglect, so failure to provide services or care necessary to avoid physical harm, mental anguish, or mental illness. So again, neglect is, is also important here. So invasion of privacy, so patients have a right to confidentiality regarding personal information and personal affairs. So, you know, they'll have things set up where, uh, you know, someone's able to even call family members, call whoever they want to, and actually have privacy. So making sure that we follow through with that, that's one of those consumer rights. Sexual harassment, so physical, verbal, or nonverbal actions or advances unwelcome by the other person. So it may be in the form of sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of sexual nature. And this is really, really important. If you are noticing anything that you feel could be perceived as sexual harassment, you again always follow, you know, report up the chain of the command, always report to your nurse. So these sexual harassment is obviously illegal, and every institution has their own policies and procedures on how they deal with these types of issues, but your first step is always going to be reporting up the chain of command, reporting to your nurse.